Viola Desmond was very much a, a woman that was ahead of her time, and not just as an African Nova Scotian woman, but as, as just a female in a society that, as we know, it was a male-dominated society at that time. Um, and, and she was somebody who, who had a business sense, somebody who saw past where she had come from and where she was born and really wanted to make an impact and, and within the business world. You know, her parents were both involved in the community, both involved in things like the Criterion Club and other social clubs that were happening in the black community. And um, it, it was just a matter of, you know, wanting to do more and wanting to have more happen that um, really elevated her within the community. She was very charismatic. Her customers refer to her as very optimistic, positive, friendly, supportive. Uh, they said going to her beauty parlor on a Saturday was the event of the week. So she had created a very special spot in her business in Halifax. But she had big plans. Uh, she had been discriminated against in terms of getting her training as a beautician. She was not allowed to train in Halifax because she was black. So she went to Montreal, to New York, and finally to Atlantic City, where she trained under some of the most famous black beauticians of the day. Of course, having gone to New York and studied at a school that was started by Madam C.J. Walker, who was the, the first black female millionaire in the United States, and somebody who was a very successful businesswoman, I mean, there was a model right there for her to look at and say, wow, she did it there, why can't I do it back in Nova Scotia? And, and then, then to come back and do that. So, I mean, she was extremely progressive. Then she was traveling across the Maritimes, setting up franchises, training women. She set up a school for black women to train in Halifax so they didn't have to go away like she had. But she was training them all across the Maritimes and uh, setting up her own line of beauty products to sell as well. The girls were there. I have a, a copy of the, of, the, of the whole program a presentation. The mayor was there of, of Halifax. Um, aldermen was there, were there, and uh, um, it was it was a wonderful affair. You know, 1946 of uh, uh, Halifax in, in Nova Scotia itself was a very much a segregated uh, way of living. There were places you were uh, accepted in and places that you were allowed to go and there were places where, where you knew not to go because you weren't going to get service or you weren't accepted in. There were just certain places, uh, you don't, you know, you're not downtown by yourself, um, you know, late in the evening after dark. There were just certain places that you knew you could go and you couldn't go and if you went, then you went with a group of people as, a, as opposed to being by yourself. Self, um, those were just things that black folks here within this province have always grown up knowing. Pretty extensive culture of discrimination in the, uh, in the 1940s. I mean, this is uh, well before any human rights legislation. So you really had a, a culture that I think was uh, reflective, I think, of some of the uh, deep-seated prejudice that uh, were pretty much uh, universal in North America. I mean, there's, there isn't a huge difference between the kind of prejudice that one would experience in, in the United States, in the South, and in, in places like Nova Scotia and even in Ontario earlier. Um, the big difference, of course, was the, the fact that uh, in the United States uh, you had Jim Crow laws that were enforced and uh, supported with local uh, ordinances and supported with the Supreme Court decision. So it was a culture, and I think it, it, uh, it was really quite insidious. The segregated Jim Crow laws, and those were laws that were prevalent in the United States. They were the segregated laws. They were the laws that said that, you know, there were colored and white drinking fountains, that there were uh, white and colored entrances to, to uh, different establishments. Usually the colored uh, uh, entrance would be at the back of the, 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 uh, the store. They were the laws that said that if, if, if you and I as a black and a white person went into a store that I had to stand back and wait until you were served until I was going to be served. And if another white person came in between time, I still had to stand back until they were served. It was the law that said that Rosa Parks had to give up her seat on the bus if a white person got on and wanted it. Those Jim Crow unjust laws we had here in this province. Although we didn't have the same rigid color bars that they did in the United States, Canada had a long history of slavery. Canada had a long history of employers uh, hiring based on race, of um, uh, residences, neighborhoods were segregated in many cases by race with homeowners only agreeing to sell to people of a certain race and not another. So we had really ghettos developing in terms of uh, where people lived and that was true across the country. 
the black community were always put on what was expected to be the worst land and furthest away from the towns. You know, as you would move out further from Halifax, there's no question that the, uh, the segregation and some of the, uh, the outward manifestations of it um, would have been a lot more uh, um, profound and a lot more in your face than they would be uh, you know, if you were in, in the major city of, uh, of the province. And that was the existence that we still carved out a legacy and still carved out a history and, um, you know, and are still here today in spite of those things. But um, there's no question, depending on where you went, depended on, on, on how you were going to be met, how you were going to be dealt with and the things that were going to be happening. Uh, across the board you had uh, you know, segregation in, in terms of uh, local uh, uh, athletic facilities, swimming pools, uh, hotels, uh, and certainly co accommodation uh, was very much uh, based on, on racial discrimination. So I think it was a pretty, a pretty widespread um, culture of, of, uh, of segregation and d discrimination varying from place to place. The color bar in restaurants and theaters was changing. In Canada, the rules were not fixed. They changed over time, and they changed at the whim, really, of the different communities and the different employers and uh, theater managers, as they decided fit. One or two people even joked they'd be better off in the Deep South, where at least they knew what the rules were. If we look at 1946 and the things that were going on, you know, we're still talking about a time when there's lynchings in the U.S., when there are, you know, a whole lot of other things that are happening there to, uh, to oppress and keep down black folks. And, and for the most part, we, you know, are, are, are a mirror or a microcosm of what's happening in the U.S. at that time. And so, you know, there were, the things that do happen down there do affect the black folks that are happening here, that, that are here within this province. I think most Canadians don't know that the Ku Klux Klan was very active in Canada. They marched in gowns, long white gowns with uh, those big funny conical head hats and they had maple leaves on their KKK ground, gowns. And they marched down the main streets of Ontario cities, uh, Saskatchewan cities. They burned crosses on the, the lawns of uh, black couples. They were active in Canada and they called themselves the Ku Klux Klan of Canada uh, with a K for Canada, KKKK. There's a feeling that, um, you know, as a Canadian, not as a black Canadian, but as a Canadian, that we came to this country to be equal with everyone else, that we came because we were fighting on the side of the British, those that would have came as loyalists, and even after the War of 1812, but we came because of the fact that we stood up for and, and said that yes, we would be on the side of the British in, in, in both of the, uh, the uh, wars that were happening. And uh, we came here with, unfortunately, uh, living out broken promises, um, you know, came as enslaved people, came as free people, came as laborers, came as skilled people as well. And in spite of the broken promises of Carve Dota, our, our, our place and our legacy within Canadian society and Nova Scotian society. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty schools, beauty salons were one of the ways that black women could make their economic fortunes in Canada and the U.S. at the time. One, because white beauty salon owners didn't care to learn about the special techniques and products and needs of women with black, uh, black women with, with different kinds of hair and skin. And uh, so Viola jumped into that crevice. Given the fact that there would have been no FedEx, UPS, any of those things to make sure that your product got around the province, obviously it meant that you had to use your own, uh, your own ingenuity to make sure um, that your product got out there. And so, uh, again, being a progressive woman, she was somebody who drove as well. And um, she made sure that, uh, you know, if she wanted to get her product out there, then she was going to have to use the personal touch and take it around. Obviously, it was a glutton for work. Uh, she hopped in her car, drove off to sell products and uh, speak with women, I, I assume women who graduated from her school who were now setting up their own shops to encourage them, help them, and uh, that's when the car broke down uh, while she was in the class.
Her car breaks down. Uh, she finds out that it's going to take uh, at least overnight. It's going to take a day for the, the, the part to, to be brought in that fixes her vehicle, that's needed to fix her vehicle. And so therefore, um, she realizes she's going to be spending the night in New Glasgow and uh, decides that she uh, doesn't want to sit in uh, a hotel room or, or uh, wherever it is that she's going to lodge for the evening and that she wants something to do. And so she decides she'll go to the Roseland Theatre and see a movie. Well, the Roseland Theatre was built in 1917, and uh, it was what I would call the Times Square of Pitt County. And uh, in 1946, it was racially segregated. The theatre itself was refurbished in 1929 in order to make it uh, appropriate for sound. And uh, the local patrons in New Glasgow, um, white patrons, um, really uh, insisted that they wanted uh, a, a, uh, a separate seating arrangement. And uh, it was because of that particular pressure that was put on uh, the, 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 um, the owner at that time that the, um, th the theatre uh, created the policy and um, enforced it uh, with respect to um, um, blacks in, in New Glasgow. Viola Desmond's husband knew that the theater discriminated because he grew up in New Glasgow and he was aware that it was a problem there, but he hadn't told Viola that. Her car broke down, she didn't know she was going to be going to the theater, she didn't have a chance to check, so she didn't know ahead of time. She goes into the theater and she asks for a ticket and she asks for one down please and she's given a ticket for upstairs because blacks were not sold tickets for downstairs. She was given a balcony ticket and change, and she went and sat on the main floor because that's what she'd asked for. And then the ticket seller came by and said to her, no, no, you can't sit here. Your ticket is for the balcony. So she said there must be some mistake. She went back to the ticket, wicket, and she said, I want a main floor seat. And the white ticket seller said, uh, we're not permitted to sell those tickets to you people. And that's the first time that Viola Desmond realized that there was a racially segregated seating policy. And apparently she made a spontaneous decision to go down and sit on the main floor. I think often people who create social change do make decisions spontaneously. Uh, but it's, it's not accidental either. Uh, most of the cases where people contested racial segregation in theaters and restaurants and movies, movie houses in Canada and the U.S. in this time period come from individuals who are middle class, uh, businesswomen, uh, businessmen, uh, people who felt that they were the leaders in their African communities that they had an obligation, I think, to um, pull the community up by the bootstraps and move forward into a more equal society. And I think she felt she had a right to sit on the main floor, and that's the decision she took. I think it, it, it must have dawned on her that this was uh, a, a challenge that she was going to mount against uh, something she felt, I think, for the moment, uh, in the moment, a very, uh, a very profound uh, injustice. And then the theater manager came, Mr. McNeil, and he said, you're not allowed to sit here. And she said, I'm not disturbing anybody. I'm behaving properly. And he said, on the, on the back of your ticket, he said, it says we can refuse to sell uh, to disorderly people. And she said, well, uh, you didn't refuse to sell to me. I have a ticket and I'm not disorderly. I'm sitting here. And he then went on, turned on heel and called a white police officer who came and they forcibly, physically removed Viola Desmond in a way that she lost her shoe in the scuffle, lost her handbag, and she was bruised. She was physically manhandled by violent, assaulted white men. Description is always that she was very, um, respectable, refined, gentle, that uh, that was one of the hallmarks of this case, is that she was so well put together. 
she was beautiful, she, her hair was beautifully done, uh, her makeup was impeccable, uh, she was well dressed and she was very well spoken. And they carried her out to a patrol car, hauled her off to jail and she spent the night in the town lockup. And so the juxtaposition of her uh, behaving so well and these burly white men carting her off to jail is just so stark. Confronted with a racist act, um, you can feel very alone, very marginalized. You know, there's a, a, a feeling in the pit of your stomach that you get when, when you're thrust into situations like that that you never forget, um, that stays with you. No matter how many people gather around you as well, a lot of times you're standing there by yourself. You're the one that's the victim, you're the one that's, or been victimized, and you're the one that has to endure it and deal with it. And so um, sometimes it can be a very lonely place to be standing when things like this happen. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure that there's no question that, that Viola Desmond felt that way, at least, uh, you know, going through what was happening at that time. The other thing is that she sat in the jail. Apparently she pulled her white gloves on. She was quite frightened. She'd never been in jail before. And she sat bolt upright, she said, in the cell all night long. She was quite afraid. But she wanted, again, to make the point that she shouldn't be there. And uh, even though she was in a lockup that w included men as well as women, and must have been very disruptive overnight. She maintained her dignity and composure all night long. She was not told by the magistrate that she could apply for bail. She was not told by the magistrate that she could get a lawyer and get some legal advice from a lawyer. She was not told by the magistrate that the trial could be adjourned until she consult it with a lawyer and of course uh, full disclosure that time was unheard of. So the trial proceeded uh, right away and we're talking about seven o'clock in the evening when she approximately when she was dragged out of the theater and then at nine o'clock the next morning she has her trial. This is a private prosecution as opposed to a prosecution initiated by a police officer. The private prosecution is started by the manager of the Roseland Theatre. Essentially she was charged with defrauding the province of Nova Scotia of one cent. It cost 40 cents for a downstairs ticket, it cost 30 cents for an upstairs ticket, and the difference in the tax was three cents and two cents. Three cents attracted to the downstairs ticket and two cents attracted to the upstairs ticket. So she was essentially charged with defrauding the province of one cent. She wasn't advised she had a right to a lawyer and she didn't have one. She wasn't advised that she was allowed to produce her own evidence, make her own arguments, cross-examine the witnesses. She was just really swimming up, up river. She didn't really know what was going on. I made my decision and you've been found guilty of tax evasion. The magistrate found her guilty of uh, unlawfully entering the theater without paying the tax, the appropriate tax. He fined her $20 and $6 costs. And oddly enough, at that time, the cost, $6, went to the manager, the man who charged her in the private prosecution. Uh, what's curious about all of this to me is that not a word was mentioned, not in the court case and uh, nowhere, at least in, in the public record, that this case was really about race. It wasn't about uh, amusement tax, uh, it wasn't about, you know, the fact that she, uh, she didn't have the right ticket. It was the fact that she was supposed to sit upstairs uh, and she uh, refused. So she got collected her car, she went back to Halifax, and then um, she started to talk to people about what might be done. Um, her husband, Jack Desmond, who was the barber who ran the neighboring business to her beauty salon, was of the opinion that uh, she should let it lie. Take it to the Lord with prayer, was his comment. He was a very religious man and he thought that there was no point in raising a fuss. She also spoke, though, with Pearlene Oliver and William Pearly Oliver, who were the leaders of the church, the Baptist church that she belonged to. 
They were very, very important figures again in the African Canadian, Canadian community of Halifax and of Canada at the time. They were real leaders. And they both thought that steps should be taken to object. She consulted uh, a doctor, and of course the doctor in turn advised her to consult a lawyer. And this is where the, uh, the advancement of Colored People Association got behind her and got her a lawyer. In 1945, a year earlier, uh, Dr. Carrie Best had started uh, the Clarion, uh, which was a newspaper which was devoted to the issues and concerns of minorities and, and in particular African Nova Scotians within the province, raising the awareness about people, letting them know some of the injustices that were going on and things of that nature. And so Dr. Best and her son Calvert um, you know, took up the fight and took up uh, raising the awareness by running a, a front page story on, uh, on Viola Desmond and exactly what had happened there at the Roseland Theatre. It started this domino effect of, you know, other organizations hearing about it. It started the effect of the justice system um, doing something wrong, the police doing something wrong. It just started this whole chain of events. I mean, imagine being being somebody who's just a successful businesswoman one day and the next day you're in the paper and you're talked about, you know, you're talked about the fact that you, you uh, defrauded the provincial government of one penny when in fact really what you did was you went against the, the unjust laws that we had in place that, that segregated a movie hall in, in New Glasgow. Um, that all of a sudden you had uh, the, uh, the judicial system down upon you, that um, you, you were arrested and thrown in jail overnight for heavens, to, you know, just to start out with that. Um, but then that you were going to be thrown into something where, you know, there were going to be organizations that were going to stand up to support you, but you're still the person that's standing there, and you're still the person that's the center of all that attention. It must have been a, a, a terrible place to have to be in as one individual, um, having to shoulder um, that fight. We went to see a man named Mr. Bissett. He uh, was a very good lawyer and thought to be respectable and gentlemanly and they thought he would make the best case they could get. And he agreed to take the case. And he started out by bringing an action for compensation, financial compensation. He said that she was assaulted, that the prosecution was malicious, that there was really no right to re eject her or bring this litigation against her. But he ran up against what he thought was a, a brick wall in those actions because she'd been convicted. So he decided a rather, it wasn't immediately, as is after further research, he made the decision that they needed to, to attack the original conviction and get it removed first before they could sue for damages. So then by that time, when he figured that out, it was too late to bring an appeal against the Theatres Act, which would have given them more scope to make arguments to reverse the conviction. There's a, there's a time limit on how long you have to appeal. It had run. And so he had to think of more creative ways. So he brought a, an, another action with the funny legal term of certiorari. It allows an upper level court to review the actions of a, of a lower court to see if they had jurisdiction to hear the case and to see if there had been any fundamental uh, uh, injustice done. It um, goes to trial before a county court judge. He goes to county court, uh, arguments, legal arguments. No warm body witnesses appear, but just legal arguments. And uh, the judge said, no, she can't uh, be successful because the number one cons uh, consideration was she must be in custody when she makes the application. She was not in custody. So her appeal, so-called, is denied. And then her lawyer decides to appeal it to the uh, Supreme Court of Nova Scotia with four judges sitting on it. So those four judges hear it. Their decisions varied and differed, but essentially the result was no. Viola Desmond cannot be successful because she was not in custody when the writ of certiorari was initiated. Two of the judges remark about what was going on here, and what was going on here was a racially segregated movie theater 
that used a public statute to prevent blacks from sitting downstairs in the theater. They had different reasons why they decided they would not reverse the conviction, but they all agreed in the end they wouldn't reverse the conviction. And so the conviction stood, and that was, I think, an indication that Canadian judges, and they were all white, Canadian judges were standing right behind a racially segregated policy in a theater, that they backed it, our Canadian laws enforced it. Such a terrible loss in the courts. It shows us that our whole legal structure was backing racist um, events, and behavior, and practices. Um, it wasn't just bad, a few bad people. Uh, this is the whole structure of the law and the courtrooms in our land that are giving power to the white theater owners, right? This is terrible stain on Canadian history. We know Viola Desmond left Nova Scotia. It must have been a, a terrible place to have to be in as one individual um, having to shoulder uh, that fight. And, and again, not that she wasn't doing it by herself because there were organizations that were trying to raise the attention, but again, the attention was all thrust on one lady. In her mind, what she wanted to do was go forward with what she was doing, which was build a business empire, and all of that got derailed as well. So even imagine thinking, coming to that realization that I'm going to have to give up everything that I'm doing here at home um, to go somewhere else because of all the, li the, the limelight I've been thrust into because of this. I, I'm, I'm, it's a tragedy in itself right there. I can't help but ask, what did the impact of that act on that day have on Viola Desmond's psychology, outlook, psychological outlook on life? Um, as you all know, she left the province, not immediately after, but she eventually left. So you can't help but ask the question, what did we lose in terms of a valuable resource? Because she was an entrepreneur, she was somebody much ahead of her time, in 1946, she had a, a beautician school, she had her own car. She, for all intents and purposes, was a thriving young woman. So that this break her spirit in some way? Was this the catalyst that actually had her to leave this province? I don't know. For me, this is the impact that racism and discrimination has on people. And if your spirit is broken, then what do you have? Because we know Viola Desmond left Nova Scotia partly because of uh, the embarrassment that, that, that was uh, thrown upon her by this happening. And probably secondly, because I, at least my own personal feeling would be, I'd have to be a little be, bit concerned about my own safety as well. I mean, we were talking uh, about a time where there wasn't a political correctness, uh, when there was no reason why there couldn't be some retaliation over the fact that she had raised um, you know, such a, uh, an eye uh, of the, the greater public on what was happening in Nova Scotia with regard to racism, with regard to unjust laws. So I'm sure that that would make anybody feel uncomfortable in those days. Um, and so therefore, you know, we, we lose somebody out of the province that goes to Montreal and then on to New York City um, that really should have been um, a, an icon when it comes to being an entrepreneur, when it comes to being an African Nova Scotian who had done great things, um, that we drove out of the province because of that. Impetus for this pardon essentially came from Viola Desmond's sister, Wanda Robson. Wanda Robson wanted an apology. And uh, it developed into that a pardon would be more appropriate. A piece in the paper saying that Dr. Graham Reynolds at, uh, it was a university uh, College of University, University College of Cape Breton at that time. Now it's Cape Breton University. It was given this course on culture and diversity and Jim Crowism and and, uh, and he mentioned several cases that he would like. This was one of his courses. I thought, gee, I'd like to sit in on that. I was teaching uh, the history of race relations in, in Nova Scotia and um, I don't remember the details about the actual moment but I, I, I 
I think I raised the question of uh, Viola Desmond in my class and Wanda um, instantly recognized, of course, this is her sister. The DVD was on the screen in the classroom and there's my sister Viola in the picture. And I said, that's my sister. Well, the rest is history because he realized that I had perhaps something that unique, perhaps I could tell his students that came in. And doing this brought everything back. All those years that happened, that happened to Viola, it brought everything back to me. And I thought, you know, this, this, this is not right. So I wrote to Mayor, I wrote to him that I was Viola's sister, and I thought perhaps something should be done, a commemorative plaque, or in some sort of a memorial, or an apology. I did not realize the steps that were going up toward this, this major event. They were going to have this apology. They were going to make it a big event. They would make it the way they felt it should be presented, not just from New Glasgow, it would be from the province. And I said, well, that's nice. The decision of the government, through the royal prerogative, that uh, they could not only give her a pardon, but give her a free pardon, it was an admission that she was wrongfully convicted. And uh, of course, she, it was a miscarriage of justice. I think it's important to, to understand the difference. Um, a pardon essentially is to remove guilt, and uh, it's, uh, it's part of our legal system and we do it all the time. But this is a, a, a free pardon, actually a mercy free pardon, which really says that it's not offering mercy, it's not recognizing that there was something that was done against the law. Um, it really does simply recognize that the, that the law was wrong in this case. And there's no mercy being, being afforded. It is simply a recognition that this was wrong at the time and it shouldn't have happened. We know now that there was no, there, there should never have been charges brought against uh, Viola Desmond. With this pardoning, we are acknowledging the wrongdoings of the past. We are also assuring Nova Scotians that all persons, regardless of race, skin color, or creed, are equal under the law. We are reinforcing our stance that discrimination and hate will not be tolerated. And today, we are continuing to make, to make life in this province better by righting a wrong, by free pardoning Mrs. Desmond, and by making sure that all Nova Scotians know her brave story. On behalf of the Nova Scotia government, I sincerely apologize to Mrs. Viola Desmond's family and to all African Nova Scotians for the racial discrimination she was subjected to by the justice system in November of 1946. The arrest, detainment, and conviction of Viola Desmond is an example in our history where the law was used to perpetrate racism and racial segregation. This is contrary to the values of Canadian society. We recognize today that the act for which Viola Desmond was arrested was an act of courage, not an offense. The government of, the, of Nova Scotia recognizes that the treatment of Viola Desmond was an injustice. This injustice has impacted not just Mrs. Desmond during her life and her family, but other African Nova Scotians and all Nova Scotians who found and continue to find this event in Nova Scotia's history offensive and intolerable. On behalf of the province of Nova Scotia, I am sorry. This was really quite a special moment, I think, for, uh, for our province. And uh, it did bring together uh, one of the last uh, remaining members of the family, uh, the younger sister of Iota Desmond, who was uh, part of the, uh, the, the occasion in, uh, in Halifax. And I think it was, a, it was a wonderful opportunity, really, to bring all the members of the community together there. 
It was a multicultural event in itself, an event that um, I think underscores the importance of human rights and something that I think that uh, is again a, a lasting recognition of this uh, as an important historical event, uh, moving us I think toward a, a better future. Oh, this is, I think it's one of the most important stories on race and law, race and women, uh, race and public services uh, in our history. It draws people in and they can feel connected to the past and to this, what it was clearly in everybody's eyes now, an egregious uh, error in law and in public policy. Um, so that's important, to, to have people connect to the harm and the injustice of it. Yes, there was racism in Nova Scotia. Uh, you know, we need to look at, is there still racism here in Nova Scotia? Well, there's racism in Canada, there's racism throughout the world. Why would it not be here in Nova Scotia as well? Um, you know, you have, to, you have to be able to own it, you have to be able to look at it, and you have to be able to deal with it. And unfortunately, from a Canadian perspective, uh, my personal opinion is that, that far too often we'd much rather sweep it under the rug than say, okay, let's, let's take it out and let's deal with it. I hope that in the present and into the future, we look quite carefully for evidence of racism that continues, race discrimination. That's out there, there's lots of it. Some of it is overt, some of it is subtle, some of it is systemic and it's just buried into our institutions and our everyday practices, and some of it seems like common sense. That's how they describe it, common sense racism. And I think we need to really probe and see what's happening out there. Why is it that we've never had a black prime minister? Why is that? Um, why are so few judges black? Uh, why do we have so few lawyers who are black? And we can just go on asking those questions. Where are they? Why are they not as prominent as a people who come from Viola Desmond's community should be in our society? Um, I think this case could challenge us to ask some questions and to become more open to seeing and understanding racism. It's come so fast, but I guess change has got to come, and change is coming. And uh, it, it's, it's uh, the, uh, the, the, the culmination, not only of me, it wasn't only me, it's all those little articles you see in papers about the struggle of the young people, of what they're doing and what they're helping to do for the children coming up behind them, and it's all about the children. It's all about the young people. They have to learn, they have to be taught. There are so many lessons to learn from Viola Desmond. Um, you can learn the whole, um, I guess, the lessons around what discrimination and what racism can do to someone. And discrimination is bad on all counts. Whether you discriminate against somebody who has a disability, you discriminate against somebody because of their religion, their sexual orientation, um, the fact that they may be obese, people are discriminated against because they, they could be obese. Um, there's all sorts of ways that people can be um, made to feel that they are less than. Bullying comes out of all of that. So the Viola Desmond story has a lot of um, areas that a teacher, a principal, a, a church minister, a rabbi, um, police officers can learn from that story. There's just so much. If you, and I'm happy to hear that um, um, these stories will be going into the schools about Viola Desmond because you need to have these stories discussed and talked about at a very early age. This is not something to be swept under the carpets. It's part of our history. This is what we need to be talking about. I have a brownie group and I asked her, I asked the children, what do you think about this? I told them about Iowa's incident. What do you really think? Do you have any questions? And one of them said, well, it just wasn't fair. She was eight years old. Of course it wasn't fair. That was her conception of the, of the whole incident. And it says it all. It certainly was not fair. It shows that when you talk to them, these children can't think. They, they really think and they notice and they know and the future is in those children.
I would say that Viola Desmond's name will live on forever. To know that now, uh, on this historical day, November the 8th, 2010, Viola Desmond's portrait is in government house. So when people see that portrait, they'll ask, who is she? And then when they're told what she represents, then again the conversation begins. The conversation will begin, and uh, isn't that terrible? That would never happen today. But you would hope that when people say that will never happen today, that they will make sure it does not happen today. And I talk about today, 2010, but I'm also talking about 2020, 2050. When you read about her, when you hear stories about her, she inspires everyone uh, with her calm, principled objection to racism. And uh, stories like that are what we, need, we, what we all need to remind us to be brave, to remind us that you don't always win. And when you don't win, that doesn't mean it wasn't worth the struggle. Uh, that there's a legacy of inspiration that hands itself on through time. And uh, Viola Desmond is just, in some ways, she's Canada's Rosa Parks, although the better way to say it is that Rosa Parks is the United States Viola Desmond, because Viola Desmond's case happened nine years before. If there's anything that we can learn from it, we, we should be learning not to make those same mistakes again. The only way in which you help to dispel some of the prejudices and some of the discriminatory actions and things that go on there is to alleviate some of the fear that's out there. And how do you alleviate the fear? You alleviate the fear by educating people so that I know as much about you and your history as you know about mine. And that's where we use, you know, if we can instill that in the youth, if we can educate the youth, that we've all played a part in Canadian history, we've all played a part in contributing to, to this wonderful country that we have, and that we all need to be respected because of that, then Viola Desmond's legacy will live on forever.